community of amazing prosperity. It's not just about me. It's about all of us. The more we do it as individuals, the more the world sees it as a group, the more others might do it too. And who knows, maybe one of these days, crazy systems like that can be changed if we do our part. Let's pray. Heavenly, he's telling these people, what you're doing is not right. Shouldn't you walk in the fear of our God to avoid the reproach of our Gentile enemies? I and my brothers and my men are also lending the people money and grain. Lending the people money and grain. But let the exacting of usury stop. And usury, we think, is you know, that, that terrible, terrible, big, huge interest. He says, give back to them immediately their fields, vineyards, olive groves, and houses, and also the usury you are charging them. The hundredth part of the money, grain, new wine, and oil. You see, Nehemiah defines usury as 1%. You see that? Nehemiah says, it is wrong for you to extract 1% from your neighbor. 1% of interest is too much. That's crazy. See, God is trying to build a community of generosity, not a community of taking advantage of each other. How does a free market economy work in this sort of situation? I don't really know. But I'm just telling you, God is trying to build a community back there in ancient Israel that is more based on generosity than taking advantage of each other. And here's the next blank. Law number three was, and this one is going to rub some of you the wrong way because I, I hate it too. Uh, it goes like this, wise national reallocation. This is going to be hard, I know, so flip with me. See it in your own Bible yourself, Leviticus chapter 25. Leviticus 25, beginning in verse 8. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to read a pretty good section here, so you've got to see this. God says, count off seven Sabbaths of years. That means seven times seven years so that the seven Sabbaths of years amount to a period of 49 years. Then have the trumpet sounded everywhere on the 10th day of the seventh month. On the day of atonement, this special, amazing day where God forgave the sins of everybody in Israel, on the day of atonement, sound the trumpet throughout your land. Consecrate the 50th year. Proclaim liberty through the land to all its inhabitants. It shall be a jubilee for you. Each one of you is to return to his family property and each to his own clan. The 50th year shall be a jubilee for you. Do not sow and do not reap what grows of itself and, and do not reap what grows of itself or harvest the unattended vines. For it is a jubilee and is to be holy for you. Eat only what is taken directly from the fields. In this year of jubilee, everyone is to return to his own property. That means if I buy land from someone and the year of Jubilee comes, I have to give it back. What? I don't, I don't want to give it back. I bought it. I paid for it. It's worth money to me. I don't want to just give it back. The ancient Israelites, we don't have any proof they ever did this once. But look at the next passage in Deuteronomy 15. In Deuteronomy 15, beginning in verse 1, it's a little bit longer, but here it goes. At the end of every seven years, you must cancel debts. <laughs> that would be great. <laughs> I've been in my house almost seven years. What if next year the bank just said, you're good? <laughs> Sweet. That'd be, that'd be pretty cool. At the end of every seven years, you must cancel debts. This is how it's to be done. Every creditor shall cancel the loan he's made to his fellow Israelites. He shall not require payment from his fellow Israelite or brother because the Lord's time for canceling debts has been proclaimed. You may require payment from a foreigner, but you must cancel any debt your brother owes you. However, there should be no poor among you. For in the land the Lord your God is giving you to possess as your inheritance, he will richly bless you if only you fully obey the Lord your God and are careful to follow all these commands I am giving you today." For the Lord your God will bless you as he promised, and you will lend to many nations, but will borrow from none. You will rule over many nations, but none will rule over you. And this is the same stuff we looked at before. Uh, if a poor man among your brothers in any of the towns the Lord your God is giving you, if there is one, don't be, disheart don't be hard hearted or tight fisted towards your poor brother. Rather, be open handed and freely lend him whatever he needs. Be careful not to harbor this wicked thought. The seventh year, the year for canceling debts, is near so that you don't show ill will. Well, that means if you know that the next year is the year to cancel debts, and you say, hey, I'm not going to loan you any money now because next year you're off scot free, 
You're evil. That's what, that's what he's saying here. He says, you loan regardless of when the year for canceling debts is. Go ahead and be generous. Go ahead and loan. Go ahead and don't take interest, but go ahead and loan. Go ahead and be generous. Go ahead and give. Go ahead and help. And next year when the debts are canceled, don't worry about it. Because see, what God is trying to do is he's trying to create a system that cares for everybody, that no one gets perpetual advantage. We are far away from that in our society today. Here's the momentum principle for us. Tithing plus generosity plus wise reallocation leads to an equitably prosperous community. Those are big words, but check this out. Equitably means everybody prospers at the same level. I don't like that. I want to prosper more than you, right? I want to prosper more than everybody around me, right? Because money symbolizes I'm better than anyone else. If I have it, I'm better than the people who don't have it. And I want to be better than other people. You want to be better than other people. It's because we're all selfish. And that's at the root of our problems. See, this is the kind of thing that could solve national problems. If everybody were committed to giving God 10% right off the top so that he could take care of the needs for worship and welfare, then we'd be good. If everybody said, I'm going to be individually generous to anyone around me who needs something, if everybody said, I'm going to be individually generous, and if everybody said, at the end of every seven years, we're going to reset the system, at the end of every 50 years, we're going to reset the system, and we're going to make everything go better, we're going to, we're going to take the poor people and we're going to make sure they're not so poor anymore, we're going to reset. If we did something like that, we would have a society that benefits everybody equally. Now, it doesn't work that way in a secular society like America. We're a capitalist society. We are a free market society. And the only real motivation that businesses and banks have to do what they do is to make more money. But here's the thing. We've bought into the lie that that's for us too. When I start talking about money, there's probably a little part in your heart. There was definitely a part in my heart earlier this week when I started planning this message that thought to myself, what does the Bible say about how I can make more money? What does the Bible say about how I can spend more smartly? What does the Bible say about how I can save more? What does the Bible say about my relationship to debt? What does the Bible say about money in such a way that it benefits me? And the more I look in the Bible, the more I see the Bible says, use money in a way that benefits others. And that really isn't very comfortable to me. This is idealism, perhaps impractical in the United States of America. We certainly can't do this as a whole culture. I don't trust our government reallocating my resources. <laughs> you probably don't either. Uh, you know, I want them to reallocate resources in my direction, right? We all do. And that's, that's our problem, really. So what do we do about it? Take a look at these final couple verses from the New Testament. So everything feels more comfortable in the New Testament. You know, there are all kinds of applications to this. Just, this is a tiny little soapbox for me. I know I'm running out of time, but this is a tiny little soapbox for me. There are people that you're going to vote for in another month. And the majority of those people are going to try to get your vote based on what they tell you about money. Because our government right now is in this economic turmoil. So the majority of the people are going to try to get your vote based on what they say about money. And if someone promises you that they're going to make sure you get more in your pocket... Write them off immediately and then investigate the rest of the field. And everyone is going to tell you that you're going to end up with more in your pocket. So that means you have to write everybody off when it comes to the economic thing. Because we're not going to vote based on who's going to provide me the better economic situation for me. We're going to vote based on who's going to give me a better opportunity to do my part in this world. That's just a little soapbox for me. But let's look at this First Timothy passage. Command those who are rich. Oh, good. That means we don't have to pay attention to this. We can just go home, right? Unless you realize that if you have seen a dollar in the last week, you're more rich than 90% of the world. Unless you realize that if you went to bed last night pretty comfortable knowing that you were going to have breakfast this morning, you're wealthier than like 20% of the people in America. 
You realize that if, if you went to bed last night with a roof over your head, you're way better off than a whole mess of people in our own country. We're rich. Paul says, command those who are rich in this present world not to be arrogant nor to put their hope in wealth, which is so uncertain, but to put their hope in God, who richly provides us with everything, everything for our enjoyment. Enjoyment. Yes, one, God gives you money. He gives you wealth. He gives you resources. He wants you to enjoy life. Yes, but keep going. Command them to do good, to be rich in good deeds, and to be generous and willing to share. In this way, they will lay up treasure for themselves as a firm foundation for the coming age so that they may take hold of the life that is truly life. God says, yes, I'm giving you wealth and resources so that you can enjoy it, but don't realize, don't think that it's all for you. Be generous, do good, take what you have, bless others with it, and God is gonna give you eternal rewards as a result. One last verse. Hebrews 13, 5. He says, keep your lives free from the love of money and be content with what you have because God has said, never will I leave you, never will I forsake you. To tell you the truth, every time I pull out a credit card, I'm doing two things. Now, for me now, I, I'm, I'm a lot better at this, and so I'm using a plastic as a convenience, and I'm paying it off 100% at the end of every month. I'm using it as a convenience thing. But, but when I pull out a credit card to charge something that I know I can't afford, that I know I'm not going to be able to pay off at the end of that month, when I do that, you know what I'm doing? I'm doing two things. I'm doing one, money will save me. Money will accomplish the goal that I have. I don't have the money, but money is what's going to do it for me. Number two, I'm saying, God, I don't trust you to take care of my needs. God, I don't trust you to help me enjoy what I have. God, I don't trust you. And God says, I'm with you all the time. Be content with what you have because you've got me. You've got the God of the universe, the creator of the stars and the whole earth. You've got me. You don't need this other stuff. And I'm saying, no, money's going to save me. And God, I don't trust you. We have to end it. We have to stop it. Because the momentum of a life based on desiring money takes you to a place of unimaginable evil that maybe you're not there now, but you could 